What if our sun just all of a sudden stopped moving? Not out in space, of course, but from here on Earth, it does happen. In fact, it happens twice a year. And during that time, the sun's daily path through our sky basically pauses. It stops climbing higher and it stops sinking lower. And for a few strange days, it kind of just hovers. Is this a glitch in the matrix or is this just nature? <laughs> well, I'm sad to report that it's not some weird sky phenomenon. It's actually just nature, which is also pretty cool. And we call this the solstice. And this moment marks a cosmic turning point where light and time subtly change directions. So why does the sun appear to freeze in place? What does it mean for our planet? What does it mean for insurance rates? And what secrets does the solstice unlock, not just in science, but across cultures? This June, the sky is full of stories. From sunlight that never fades in the Arctic, to deep sky treasures rising in the dark, to planets performing dances near the moon, which is nice. We're going to be breaking down all of that in this month's Space Guide. I'm Sarah Matthews, and as always, grab a snack and let's get into more of these details about why the sun appears to freeze. So to understand why the sun appears to freeze, we have to zoom out, not just in space, but in time. This all starts with the geometry of Earth's motion. Earth doesn't spin like a perfectly upright top. Instead, its rotational axis is tilted about 23.5 degrees from vertical, and this tilt is what is constant as Earth orbits the Sun, meaning the direction of the tilt doesn't change most of the time, but it does every few couple thousand years, but that's for another talk. But for now, it always points roughly toward Polaris, the North Star. But as Earth orbits the Sun, that fixed tilt causes different parts of the planet to get more or less sunlight over time, and this is why we have the seasons. In June, the northern hemisphere tilts towards the sun, where days grow longer, sunlight hits more directly, and we get summer, whereas in December, it tilts away, bringing shorter days and winter cold. The same is true for the southern hemisphere, but in reverse. Now, what's also really cool is that if you tracked the sun's position in the sky at noon each day, you'd see it climb higher from winter to summer, then stop. Right around June 21st, that upward motion halts, and then for a few days, it barely changes at all and that's the solstice, and it literally translates from Latin to sun standing still, basically. It's not that the sun changes its behavior, Earth is still spinning, still orbiting, but from our perspective, the sun's vertical movement hits its peak, pauses, then slowly reverses. And this happens twice a year, in June and again in December. The June solstice marks the longest day of the year for the Northern Hemisphere, or basically when we get the most light. And then after that, the sun's path starts dipping lower each day and daylight begins to shrink. And this isn't just some sort of astronomical trivia, it really does have implications to everything on Earth. This shift in solar angle and day length affects everything from climate patterns to animal migration to human sleep cycles. In fact, there's even a way to visualize the sun's wandering path throughout the year with a little bit of planning and a little bit of patience. If you stood in the same place at the same time every day, say at solar noon, and then snapped a photo of the sun, what you'd get isn't a straight line. Over the course of a year, these photos trace out a very smooth figure eight in the sky, and this pattern is called the analemma. And it's not just pretty, it really is very deeply revealing. So at the top and the bottom of the figure eight are the solstices, and that's where the sun's highest and lowest noontime positions are in the sky. And then right in the middle, where the paths cross, are the equinoxes, when day and night are nearly equal and the sun is directly above the equator. So more or less, the analemma is this visual signature of Earth's motion, and it captures two key ingredients. Earth's axial tilt, which causes the height of the sun to vary, and Earth's elliptical orbit, which causes our orbital speed to change slightly over the year. And that's why the figure isn't symmetrical. So one loop of the analemma is bigger than the other because Earth moves faster when it's closer to the sun in January and slower when it's farther in July. So for photographers who capture analemmas, you're basically turning time into an image where it takes months of planning, precision, and clear skies, but the result is this very beautiful visual map of how sunlight changes throughout the seasons. In fact, long before we ever even had telescopes or clocks or orbital models, people noticed that something strange was happening with the sun. Its rising and setting points on the horizons weren't fixed. Each day, the sun shifted slightly north or south, but twice a year, those shifts slowed and then stopped, then reversed. Now, maybe you've heard of Stonehenge in England before. The summer solstice sunrise aligns perfectly with the heel stone, lighting up the center of the site. 
where in Ireland, the passage tome at Newgrange was designed so that a winter solstice sunrise, a narrow shaft of light travels down the passage and illuminates the inner chamber, something that only happens on that day. And then across the world at Machu Picchu, Karnak, Chaco Canyon, and countless other sites, people designed architecture not just to house or shelter, but to frame the sun, marking the turning points of its journey. And so these moments, these solstices, became very powerful markers of time. So what does this all mean for your sky? Well, it actually depends on where you are on Earth, which makes sense, I think, after everything we've talked about thus far. If you're near the equator, your daylight doesn't change much year-round. Days and nights are roughly equal, about 12 hours each day of sunlight and 12 hours of dark. Now, if you go to the poles, the contrast becomes very extreme. One solstice marks the beginning of 24 hours of daylight, the other 24 hours of night. And this all comes down to a simple angle, the tilt of Earth and your position on the globe. So while the solstice is one day on a calendar, its effects ripple differently across the world. It really reshapes the sky above you, changing not just how much light you get, but how you experience time itself. Now around the solstice, the length of daylight isn't the only thing that changes, so does the quality of darkness. So in mid to high latitudes, roughly, I don't know, 50 to 70 degrees north or south, you might notice something really odd around late June. True night never fully arrives. Even after the sun sets, it doesn't dip far enough below the horizon to bring complete darkness. And instead, the sky lingers in this kind of permanent twilight. So astronomers divide this into three twilight phases based on how far the sun is below the horizon. First, we have civil twilight. And this is where the sky is still bright enough to see without artificial lights. Then we have nautical twilight. The horizon remains visible and a few bright stars appear. Then we have astronomical twilight, and this is where the sky is almost dark, but never fully black. So in places like Scotland, Scandinavia, Alaska, and parts of Canada, these twilight phases can overlap and stretch throughout the night. And this makes it incredibly difficult to observe deep sky objects or even see the Milky Way clearly. And the effects work in reverse too. So around the winter solstice, these same regions can spend weeks in near continuous darkness where even the brightest parts of the day feels like dusk. So depending on your latitude, the solstice can bring either too much light or not nearly enough. And this in-between light has a strange beauty to, of its own. It blurs the boundary between day and night, challenging our idea of what darkness even means. And just because the sky isn't fully dark doesn't mean it's empty. On that note, let's talk about the moon phases this month. So our full moon this month is actually called the strawberry moon, not because it's going to turn into a strawberry, although that would be pretty interesting. Um, and no, it's not going to be turning red either. Um, it's actually called the strawberry moon because in the northern parts of the Americas, this is when it is the great strawberry harvest, which is also really great news because I think a lot of people love strawberries, except if you're allergic, although you might still like them. Then later in the month, we have the new moon, which is going to be great for capturing deep space objects, the Milky Way, as well as not to loosen clouds. And then mid-month, look for a striking visual event where the moon and Mars will come into very close proximity. And if you're an observer in South America, for example, this will actually be an occultation where the moon passes directly in front of Mars, briefly hiding it from view. Otherwise, this is going to be a close approach for other places throughout the world. And for some people, it's going to be a Mars and lunar conjunction. So yeah, again, if you're in parts of South America, look for that occultation. It is super, super cool to see. Next, we're going to look deeper, literally, at what's going on with our deep space objects this month and the Milky Way. June is when the Milky Way core, or the densest and most vibrant part of our galaxy, starts to rise into view for many in the Northern Hemisphere much earlier on in the evening. So if you are at mid to low latitudes, you'll get increasingly better views as the month progresses. And then under dark skies, look south late at night and you'll start to see the Milky Way arch stretch from horizon to horizon. If you're experiencing very limited astronomical twilight in those higher mid latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere, you can still photograph the Milky Way. You're just going to need a little bit more exposure time. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, combat any sort of rumors that you can't actually photograph the Milky Way. You can still photograph it. It's just going to be really important that you definitely do it on a moonless night and uh, somewhere away from city lights, of course. And yeah, just don't expect as much contrast as you would, you know, later on in the summertime. If you're into deep space astrophotography, this is going to be a fantastic time to begin long exposure projects. 
And another note, if you are at these higher latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere, I would recommend looking for circumpolar targets. Um, these are targets that are near the North Celestial Pole, so they're up pretty much all night. So for deep space targets, look for anything like that listed on the screen. You're also gonna to want to pick targets that are fairly bright so you can collect a lot of data pretty quickly since you do have limited darkness. But if you're in most parts of the United States, you have a little bit more opportunity to capture some really beautiful nebulae that are starting to rise even earlier and rising higher in the sky. The Lagoon Nebula, the Trifid Nebula, the Eagle Nebula, and the Swan Nebula, which are some of my personal favorites. They are bright and beautiful and very large. Most of them are emission nebulae, so they're emitting light, um, but the Trifid Nebula is actually a reflection nebula and a emission nebula. So dark skies are gonna be really important. But the nice part about these targets is that while they may be very low on the horizon for anyone, you know, if you're like in New York or something, you can still collect a good amount of data on them pretty quickly because they are pretty bright. You're just gonna to have to do it over a couple of days if you wanna get even more detail. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, June is a golden month for deep sky. Targets like RCW-113 and RCW-105 are both vibrant emission nebulae, and they're very well placed in the evening sky. Um, just look for them near the Southern Cross constellation in the Scorpius Sagittarius region, where the galactic core climbs high overhead. And of course, don't forget about those wide field panoramas, especially if you have access to very dark skies, the Milky Way structure um, becomes especially pronounced in long exposure shots, revealing dust lanes, star clouds, and nebulae that are invisible to the naked eye. So that's all we have for this month, but if you'd like to check out more information on how to capture an analema throughout the year, check out my Patreon and there should be some more details over there. So. I hope this was helpful for you all. Let me know down in the comments what you're imaging this month and what else you'd like to see in this series. And until the next month, I hope you all have clear skies. Thanks, guys.